Good afternoon. This is a short podcast entitled Writing the Lab Abstract in Computational Chemistry. And this particular podcast could also be used for writing the abstract in classes other than computational chemistry, but the focus of this one will be primarily on those um, uh, abstracts that are meant for the computational chemistry literature. There is a general structure to a, a scientific abstract and I'm always nervous about putting a word count up here because then people will start counting words and you really don't want to do this but a, an abstract is somewhere between 100 and 250 words and what you should get from that is it's pretty concise writing so don't count words okay you don't want to run this through the word count uh, tool in Microsoft Word okay? try to get out of the habit of, of counting words it's as that word count suggests, and this is probably the most important part, it's about one paragraph in length. So it's not a long, it's not an entire piece of paper, it's not a full page, it's really one paragraph. You will not have any data tables or any graphics in an abstract. Now, you may have data in your abstract, but you won't have any data tables or graphics. You can insert mathematical equations. You can use LaTeX or you can use the equation editor in Microsoft Word or some other mathematical typesetting uh, system, but it is okay to insert mathematical equations, including chemical reactions, into your abstract. And as I've alluded to uh, at the very beginning of this, it's very concise writing. It's meant to be very brief, very informative, and very short. Uh, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, one of the challenges to uh, writing in science is that unlike the humanities where the passive voice is generally considered to be uh, not okay, uh, it is uh, considered, and it's actually quite common for you to use passive voice in the uh, writing of a scientific abstract, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that later. Okay, so what is an abstract? And this is... Um, directly out of a, uh, a textbook entitled Write Like a Chemist, put out by the American Chemical Society. And as, the, as it says here, an abstract is concise and highly informative. The abstract informs readers about the purpose, the theoretical or experimental approach, the principal results, and the major conclusions of the work. Now, I've added in there uh, under RRG the term computational because in your case, you're going to be describing the uh, computational approach, not an approach that you would use in a physical lab or that you are doing as a theoretician. And again, this is from Write Like a Chemist by Robinson and Stoller. There are two major components to an abstract. The first part is the keywords. These are searchable words that help scientists find relevant works. And these are typically required in most abstracts. And I'll include keywords in all of the abstracts that I show you in this presentation. And some journals provide a list of keywords for authors to choose from. I'm currently getting a publication ready for the Journal of Chemical Education. And they sent me a two-page sheet that has all of the uh, keywords and I have to choose up to eight keywords for my particular article. And then the second component is the abstract itself, which is what this podcast will primarily look to talk about. Okay, there is in writing an abstract, and this is the, I took this directly from the American Chemical Society publication entitled Write Like a Chemist. Uh, there are what they call moves, and a move is defined as a step taken by writers to achieve part of their overall purpose. And writers who use conventional moves in their written work will meet the organizational expectation of their readers. That's a direct quote uh, from Robinson and Stoller. And the example that they give here, well, let me move on here. They describe in this textbook a, what they call a move structure. So what you see on the right-hand side there is the move structure for telling a joke. So in step one, you set up the joke. In step two, you would describe the action or the, the main body of the, of the joke. In step three, you're starting to wrap up uh, and, get, and getting your setup for the punchline done. And the very last step of the move structure is delivering the punchline. So each of these four things represents what they call a move. And as you'll see here momentarily, uh, there are some moves in terms of writing abstracts and other scientific publication that folks like the American Chemical Society consider to be essential, meaning you have to have them, and those that are considered optional, uh, and as the name suggests, means you don't have to have them. 
So let's take a look at what the ACS describes it as, as an abstract move structure. The first thing is the, obviously is the state what was done. And one approach to this is you can identify the research area and why it's important. So hence why your, your paper will be important. By the way, the abstract is typically written as the very last thing that you write. You typically write the paper first. And then when you're all done, you write the abstract. Um, we'll be doing a little bit of, of, of that in the computational chemistry course. Uh, but you'll really probably mostly be writing the abstract sort of as a standalone. You won't really be writing a full journal article. Okay, uh, uh, understate what was done. You can also, and again, both of these are optional, you can mention a gap that's addressed by the work. So such and such a researcher did this work. Uh, this is what they found out. They, they didn't look at some other aspect of that particular problem and this paper that, that you are describing through your abstract mentions the gap addressed uh, by the work that you were doing. And the last one is an essential is you need to state the purpose and there are the accomplishments of the work. And typically the emphasis is on the former where you're really describing in your abstract what is the problem you were trying to solve, what were you trying to accomplish, what was the question you were trying to answer. So that's going to be an essential component. Okay, number two, you got to identify the methods are used, and fundamentally, this, this means the procedures, and this is an essential move. In the computational realm, uh, what you are describing here is the computational approach. You performed a uh, DFT B3LYP uh, 631G uh, molecular orbital determination using Gaussian 03, so you are describing your computational approach. Uh, in, in this, this, uh, the procedures or the methods move, and again, that is an essential, uh, essential move. You have to be able to describe enough of what the procedure is. It's not a detailed step-by-step -step description, but you have to be able to describe enough so that the reader can sort of close their eyes and, and basically be able to imagine or visualize what it was that you did. And again, this assumes that the person reading your abstract um, is an experienced chemist in your case, either a computational chemist or an experimental chemist, and they can imagine by reading your procedures and, and get a sense of exactly what you're doing. And the last part of the abstract move structure is to report your principal findings, and the essential one is to highlight the major results, either quantitatively or which means numerically, data numbers, or qualitatively, okay, more word-based descriptions, and of course this is a major or essential move. Now the trick on this is that you're trying to highlight the major results. You're trying to highlight the most important thing that you found and that you are reporting in this particular paper. When you actually write the paper you may have tons and tons of data in there but you've basically in your principal findings have to reduce that down to okay what was the most important accomplishment, what was the most important thing that you learned. And you can alternative or optionally, you can offer some sort of com concluding remark, as we'll see in a minute here, uh, especially with students who are new to writing abstracts. Uh, this tend to be they these tend to be fluff, uh, meaning sort of garbage statements that that students throw in at the end, uh, just to make uh, add to the word count a little bit. Okay, there's also a six sentence format. I'm, I'm always a little nervous about uh, presenting this format because uh, some of you will think, oh, if I just follow this sort of uh, formula, uh, then I will have a good abstract. Um, but that's not always the case. But let me present it to you anyway. Sentence one, and you'll see, and I've tried to correlate it back to the ACS move structure format. So sentence one primarily is to state the purpose center of the problem being solved and that relates back to essential move 1.3. Okay, Sentences two and three maybe will describe the procedure, the methodology, the experimental approach, or in the case of the comp chem uh, class, the computational approach. It's typical that that's going to take two sentences uh, to describe what you did. Uh, you can make one long sentence uh, but typically it's better to have two, two shorter sentences. So that's usually going to be sentences number two and three. Sentences four and five would probably describe the major findings, and again, this relates to essential move 3.1, and this is where you describe your results. 
and what was the where you highlight the major finding or the major major conclusion of your particular work and sentence six uh, could be some sort of concluding statement what your next steps are um, what still needs to be uh, you know what what still needs to be discovered what you would do next and that again is optional move 3.2 so the six sentence format might actually be five sentences it could be four it could be six it could be seven but basically that is the structure of the six sentence format uh, some other considerations in the font size on this will be pretty small. I tried to jam all of this into one slide. Uh, in terms of verb tense, past tense is used to refer to work completed and to describe results. So, for example, a sentence might be antioxidative compounds were isolated. Okay, so that's the use of a past tense. Present tense is used to make statements of fact, to identify information reported in the paper, and the state believes expected to be true over some long period of time. For example, um, atrazine is a commonly used herbicide. That's not something you particularly discovered in your, your research, but this is a statement of fact that everybody um, probably would agree with. So you would use present tense in that case. Present perfect tense is used to summarize the work of others, to demonstrate a gap in the research, to introduce your own work, and or to report your principal findings. So uh, as an example of principal findings, you would say something like here for the first time, three different uh, dinitroaniline pesticides have been shown, and that's your present perfect tense, to cause cancer. Okay, so in this case, you are reporting your principal findings. That's what, what, was, what occurred in this particular research paper. Okay, in terms of voice, you should be familiar with passive voice, and that's actually more common in scientific writing. You probably won't find that very much in humanities or social science writing. So an example of this is the effects of basis set selection were studied for a group of alkyl halides. And whereas uh, you could also use active voice, that's actually much less common, and here is that basically the same sentence in active voice variations in the basis set selection did not affect the data for halides. Okay, so um, again, passive voice is not the evil thing that maybe many of your English teachers tell you it is. You'll see it very quite often in scientific writing. Pronouns, uh, the pronoun I is rarely if ever used in, certainly not in the abstract, but also not very much even in the uh, final paper. Uh, we is also rarely used. We're seeing it used more often, but it's still pretty pretty rare. And you only will use we when you refer to the work that the authors present in the paper. So, for example, um, pardon me, let me go back. I think I might have lost that last. Yep, I lost that last bullet. But basically it said, uh, in this paper we are reporting our... Uh, theoretical studies of alkyl halides, and that sentence, uh, so you could use we there. So you can use we in an abstract if there's more than one of you doing the work, uh, but you really want to try to avoid pronouns uh, if possible. Okay, what I'm going to do now in the last uh, five or six slides, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through them, is showing you some example abstracts. Some of these are from students uh, that took the computational chemistry class, and I'm not necessarily presenting these as particularly as uh, good ones or bad ones. They just are what they are. So uh, this particular one is modeling excited states of fluorescent compounds with UV vis spectra calculations. And you can see in their abstract there, it's about 100 or so words. We could count sentences there. What is that? One, two, three, four, five. I think I've got six sentences there. If you look down at the keywords, their keywords are excited states, DMABN, UV vis spectrum, oscillator strength, and homo lumo gap. So I encourage you to look at this abstract and uh, see how well it does with the uh, essential move structure. Okay, uh, here's an example of an abstract that actually has numerical data in it. This again was from students that took our, my class several years ago. They're saying a computational examination of uh, the potential energy of this compound was undertaken, okay? They talk about, uh, uh, they have a sentence there that talks about how they did their calculation. Uh, so the ge geometric optimization was computed at the Hartree-Folk level using the 631GD basis set. 
their principal findings. They found one method was closer than another method. Um, and then they have some data in there. They said they found uh, their data, they had percent errors ranging from 99.9% to 161.3%. Lots of errors in there. And their keywords in there, potential energy scan AM1 and PM3. Okay, so there's a, an example of an abstract that has a little bit of numerical, a little bit of quantitative data as part of the abstract. Uh, here's one that I chose out and I took the names off of it. Um, this one is, I would consider this one to be particularly worry, uh, wordy. Uh, they didn't do a particularly good job in describing uh, what it is they did or how they did it. Okay? Their purpose statement, which is the goal of this project, doesn't appear until the second or third sentence. That's not horrible, but you typically in an abstract want to have your purpose statement right up front so that the person reading it can read your what you're trying to do, what your problem is, what you're trying to study, and then make a decision after the first sentence whether or not he or she wants to continue reading it. So this one was pretty wordy. Uh, there's some, they actually did a good project, but the abstract is not written in a very concise way. Uh, I call this one the no work abstract. This is, was done by uh, some students who basically just waited to the last minute uh, to sort of do something. And they have a statement there at the very end, due to limited data availability, some results were ambiguous. And their limited data availability uh, emanated primarily from the fact that they waited to the last minute and didn't get some of their calculations done. So you don't really see a procedure in here. You don't really have, uh, you have some sense of what they're trying to do, but it's not very well done. And they say computational efforts made extensive use of the Gaussian engine. That doesn't mean anything. What in the world does extensive use mean? Um, so this is a pretty poor abstract and would score pretty poorly um, for you as it did for them. Okay, here's a what I would call a fluff abstract. Uh, it's not bad. It, does, it doesn't violate the essential move. Uh, structure of the ACS there in uh, what they're doing is they're uh, putting in there why they think this is an important problem. We often use computational chemistry methods to solve real world problems. That's a little fluffy. Okay, yeah, everybody knows that. We know that CompChem is used to study real problems. We don't just use CompChem to make stuff up. Okay, the statement, one of the many problems we face today is global warming and air pollution. That's not bad. I mean, that's sort of a little background or why this is important. Uh, the, we decided to look at different nitrogen containing problems. That's a pretty badly worded statement. First of all, it has a we in it, which I don't really like. Uh, but that could have been, uh, you know, reworded. The purpose of this uh, research was to look at different nitrogen containing compounds. So that could have been written much differently. Uh, their procedure section is uh, a little bit too much using the molecular editor builder of uh, WebMO on the North Carolina School CompChem server. Uh, you know, that's a pretty fluffy statement. And at the very end there, uh, their last statement, this difference could be a major factor. And I guess that's probably okay. But there's, there's a, a fair amount of fluff in this particular abstract, okay? It's a little bit too wordy with stuff that's not really that informative. Um, Here's an example of an abstract that was written before the lab is done. So they have in there that we perform geometry optimizations. Uh, but then somewhere, uh, the very last statement, potential energy and molecular energy calculations will help explain why the, the chelated or chelated configuration exists in nature. So they actually wrote their abstract before they actually did the, the, the research, which is why they have a future tense, fu uh, excuse me, future tense term in there will help explain. So that could have been done a little bit better. Okay, I like this one. Um, it's pretty clear uh, at the very beginning what they're, what they're trying to do. Uh, they have a pretty good procedure section. They've got some real data in there. Uh, they, uh, at the very end, they made some observations uh, that are actually useful. The fact that a more computationally expensive geometry optimization did not necessarily produce more accurate calculated energies. That's a pretty nice statement. So all in all, this is not a bad abstract. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. Okay, and now I have the next three or four slides are uh, 
abstracts that I've, I've taken from the professional literature. All of these come from the Journal of Computational Chemistry. And so these are certainly a little bit more sophisticated than some of the ones I've shown you as the examples. And I won't walk you through all of this. Uh, notice, by the way, in this one, they do use the pronoun we. And again, that's not a horrible thing to do, but uh, it, uh, you use it pretty judiciously. Okay. Um, here's one from ab initio potential energy service and vibrational energy frequencies of zinc hydride. And again, you notice in this one, it's a pretty short abstract. Um, it's not badly done. Notice I, I picked this one primarily because you see they have some embedded mathematics in that or they're using some mathematical symbology. Uh, so that's a pretty good, that's a reasonably good abstract. Okay, and again, one more from the literature. Uh, you should also take make sure you look at the keywords in there, um, and then the abstract: uh, a quantum chemical method for rapid optimization of protein structures is proposed. That's a pretty nice opening statement. There may it's a really clear statement of what this article is going to be about. I can read that first sentence there, and at the end of that sentence, I can say, well, I don't really care about optimizing optimizing protein structures. Of course, that's also in the title. Uh, that's a good technique, by the way, is to your, your title and your first line uh, might want to be the exact same thing. So that's not a bad thing to do. So that's a pretty good uh, abstract from the literature. And if you have any questions about writing an abstract, you're going to be writing abstracts for every lab that you do, uh, at least every big lab that you do. And by the end of the course, you should be uh, quite experienced at it. That's all I have, and have a good day.